So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. And we are approaching that point where the, the 24, the uh, standpoint of scientific metaphysics, will give way before this principle in its science. This is really why the, um, the world is becoming for us Christian science. The, the world, Christian science is the world. The world is Christian science, you see. That all fields belong to God and his Christ. Belong to the Word and the Christ. All fields belong to the Word, to the seven, and to the Christ, the four. Huh? They're all fields of the seven and the four. So let's summarize where we are now. The book is open, and we see the vision of divine science, which handles error at all levels, all forms of error. But we need to be watchful. You need to see that we can't use divine science because that belief is the belief of the three and a half, of not having gone over the three and a half. That if we do not go that perilous passage over the three and a half and it's perilous for us, perilous for the human sense because it involves the uncertainty. That there are no assurances that we will get what we have outlined as a demonstration in Christian science. That's, that's what's perilous about it. But if we don't go that perilous passage, it will just dry up on us. It will die on us. Those two witnesses will be dead in the streets. And so we need to go beyond mind, spirit, soul. We need to mature in our understanding of science, go all the way to principle, because only principle can demonstrate life, truth, and love. And this way has to be an unconditional way that we unconditionally surrender our small sense of demonstration for the demonstration of God principle, for the demonstration of true Christianity. It's a pure demonstration. You know where we find that, uh, that rendering pure demonstration as a... Um, <coughs> as an epitome uh, for a category, say, in, uh, in one of our matrices. Did you know? Pure demonstration. It's actually in the word matrix. In the J index, at the point of Christianity, we have that pure demonstration where uh, we have the line, plane, space, and fourth dimension of spirit, where she says that uh, Christian science is the infinite calculus defining the line, plane, space, and fourth dimension of spirit. And this is the pure demonstration, that we begin to demonstrate the line of spirit, 
the plane of spirit, the space of spirit, the fourth dimension of spirit, the calculus of spirit. So that brings us to chapter 12, and we come back again to uh, the Apocalypse chapter. Uh, before going into the, uh, the text uh, on the God-crowned woman, I just want to give you uh, some more background on uh, the place value of this chapter. You know that it's chapter 16 in the textbook, and so it has the place value within the matrix of Christian science uh, of science reflecting science. So we have science as science, the first sense of science being that from the absolute standpoint, namely that principle and idea is one. And secondly, science from the relative standpoint, the standpoint of scientific understanding. So that the meaning of science as science is the scientific understanding of the oneness of being. Revelation shows us the bridge, Revelation as a whole, is showing us the bridge from the 5,000 year period to the 6th and 7,000 year periods. When we come to the apocalypse, we see the dealing, that we are dealing with the 6th and the 7,000 year periods very specifically. Um, in the Apocalypse, then, Mrs. Eddy is picking up the subject of truth and love, picking up the subject of the 6th and 7th thousand year periods. And whereas John has looked forward into the future, Mrs. Eddy says, this is that future. The textbook and Christian science is that future. And so she went on, and she's the only one who really went on. The only one who really went on. In the Apocalypse, you see that we have at the beginning of the chapter the two scriptural notes. That first scriptural note being, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the word of this prophecy, and keep those things that were written therein, for the time is at hand. And we see that she has uh, taken from Revelation 1, 3. Um, that's all right. You recall that uh, in uh, Revelation 1, 1 to 1, 3, that um, John was giving the four, that he presented the four. So to say, everything is the four and the revelation of the four. When Mrs. Eddy gives the scriptural note, she picks up part of that. She doesn't pick up the word or the Christ or the Christianity sense, but the science aspect of that four, that fourfold statement. Isn't that something? See how exact it is that she picks up the science aspect and also shows that there are four embedded in that science aspect. 
science as the word. Blessed is he that readeth. In other words, he who seeks, he who wants to, to learn, to be instructed, to, uh, to be taught. Science then as the Christ, and they that hear the word of this prophecy, they that reflect the Christ consciousness or are receptive to that, that new uh, idea, that take that new idea in, science as Christianity, and keep those things that were written therein. That sense of keeping is always the, um, the demonstration of Christianity, the holding to it, the demonstrating of it. And finally, a science sense for the time is at hand. And again, we have that, that, that principal science is always at hand. It's the omni-action, the timeless omni-action of principle. So you have uh, in that first scriptural note already the, uh, the uh, distilling from revelation of the standpoint of science and even a further uh, explication of what science is through the calculus of science, through the fourfold sense of science. Then we come to the second scriptural note. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. So we have the city of our God, we have that mountain, a mountain always being the great calculus, the calculus of, uh, of well, mountain and the holiness, the calculus, really, of divine science. So in the first scriptural note, you have a kind of approach or an ascending way or an objective sense. And in the second scriptural note, you have everything out from God, from God's holy mountain, from the city of our God, as a descent or a descending way or a subjective sense. Once again, epitomizing what the whole chapter will show us, first the approach and the ascending way up to that holy city, and secondly, coming out from that holy city, from that holy mountain, through the city of our God, uh, making the descent all the way to the level of Christian science, but from the subjective standpoint. It's so exact. And so that brings us to the fourth vision. We're making good inroads into uh, Revelation and Apocalypse. The fourth vision of love. We've had the analysis of what God is with the seven seals. We've had the uncovering of what God is not with the seven trumpets, that equipolence. And now comes the third aspect of that um, uh, algorithm, that procedure, that process of analysis, uncovering, and annihilation, the aspect of annihilation or complete spiritualization, if we want to see it from another standpoint. And we see that there are two methods, two methods, methods of annihilation. They uh, both belong to Christianity, have to do with Christianity. And the first is to trace everything back to God, to trace all back to God as good, to see the idea in its principle. And the second method is to see how truth destroys error, the self-destruction of error. As we go on uh, and get into the next aspect of our subject, we will see that actually these two methods are uh, 
are characterized by or are symbolized by those two angels, Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel standing for the first method of annihilation, the tracing of all as good back to God, the seeing of the idea in its principle, love. That's Gabriel. And the second method, the destruction of error through error's own self-destruction is the method of Michael. So we have uh, what Mrs. Eddy calls the divine method of warfare in science. And when she begins to tell us about the woman, she says this is the divine method of warfare in science. That fourth vision of love then is in the Christianity order. Um, it is concerning a great wonder in heaven, the God-crowned woman with her child, and the great red dragon trying to consume that child, to take that child away and destroy it, and the divine method of warfare in science. She says the wrong method of warfare is trying to meet error with error. This method she will not depict in Apocalypse, but we will find it depicted in Revelation. So the fourth vision, which has to do with the God-crowned woman, is uh, epitomized by Max Kapler as the divine method of handling evil. Uh, she says in her chapter, the twelfth chapter of Apocalypse, typifies the divine method of warfare in science and the glorious results of this warfare. She also says the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse or Revelation of St. John has a special suggestiveness in connection with the 19th century. So again, she is picking up on something that she feels is characteristic of her time, her mission, as though to say, it suggests my mission. That my mission is typified by the woman in the apocalypse. That the appearing of Christian science is typified by the woman in the apocalypse and that child. She knew that she fulfilled that. As, as though to say to, to that extent, I am the woman in the apocalypse. But because that woman is a type, it typifies a state of consciousness generally. It's man generically. It says the woman is generic man. It also typifies, therefore, a state of consciousness in you, in each one of us. That each one of us must become that woman. It is certainly no uh, coincidence that we are on the verge of the 7,000 year period, the birth of the idea of divine science, and that the Christian science movement has to wrestle with this whole question of the woman in the apocalypse. That that question is really turning the field 
inside out, upside down, yes. And it's beautiful to see that the field is wrestling with that, that they're not as apathetic as we thought they might be, that they're not all asleep, that some are awake and that there's an uprising to try to answer this question and to see its ramifications with respect to the, uh, the government, you see the government of that uh, church and the future of that church and the meaning of the discovery of Christian science and the meaning, therefore, of the textbook. We don't know what it will mean for the whole idea. We only know that nothing happens out of the context of the whole, that everything belongs to that context and that development, and that everything is steering towards that 7,000-year period, steering towards the opening up of the whole idea of divine science. So we can only be true to our principle and not try to second guess anything and not try to be critical of anything or to take any stance, any hard and fast stance on the whole thing, just to know that that principle and its calculus are driving everything and that love is the attractor, divine love. Divine principle, love, is the attractor in the field. And that's stirring up everything. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. What does Mrs. Eddy say the woman symbolizes? She symbolizes the highest aspect of God's idea. She symbolizes generic man the spiritual idea of God's motherhood, the coincidence of God and man as the divine principle and divine idea, the correlation of divine principle and spiritual idea. She symbolizes a lot, and you can see again, it's another symbol that is overformed or that has many different aspects to it. It isn't just a simple, you know, flat, what would you say, mono-dimensional, one-dimensional thing. It's many-dimensioned. Many-dimensioned. Which means that, that we can't just uh, grab the meaning of it. it. It takes a lifetime to understand these things, doesn't it? It takes a lifetime of living with these things and loving these things and, and allowing them to reveal themselves. And the child, what does the child symbolize? The Christ idea as science. Well, each one of us is this woman who must bring forth the Christ idea as science. And we're going to see what that means as we take the uh, text involved here. Uh, let me just quickly give you the breaks and ask you to look at this text tonight. It is in the Christianity order and uh, thus begins with principle. That tone starts on page 560, line 6, and goes to 562, line 21. Then the tone of mind, 562, line 22 to 28. 562, line 29 to 565, line 5, is the tone of soul. The tone of spirit. 565, 6 to 28. Life, 565, 29 to 566, 24. Truth, 566, 25 to 568, 12. 
and Love, 568.13 to 572.2. And then you have a summary of Love's Christianity uh, on 572, line 3 to 18. So let us um, spend some quiet time with that this evening, and we will discuss it in the morning. <laughs>